Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, May 15th, 2022. This is Deacon Barry Taylor, and we are in Lesson 11 from the Faith Pathway Quarterly, uh, Unit 3, which is entitled Liberating Letters. Liberating Letters, and our lesson title is Receiving a Good Inheritance. Receiving a good inheritance. Devotional reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. Background scripture, Galatians chapter 3. And our printed or lesson passage is Galatians 3, verses 18 to 29. Our key verse from the King James Version is, If ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. Lesson aims from the quarterly or number one. Explore the differences between living according to God's law and living by faith in Christ Jesus. Number two, celebrate the freedom God promises to give all who believe in Christ. And number three, practice ways you can embrace this liberation and oneness in Christ. From the Standard Commentary, our lesson title is Freedom and the Law. Freedom and the Law. Additional aims are, number one, summarize what makes a person a child of God through faith in Christ. Number two, compare and contrast life under the law with a life of faith in Christ. Then number three, write out a promise God has made to him or her as an heir. And that's to each of us. We're going to use uh, some of what each uh, commentary uh, provides uh, uh, for the lesson, uh, however, uh, we're going to follow the outline of the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. And after the introduction, that outline has three divisions. The first is entitled, To Guard Us for God. That's covered between Galatians 3, 18 and 21. The second is, To Guide Us to God. That's covered between chapter 3, verses 22 and 25. And then the last division is to give all to God. And that's covered between chapter 3, verses 26 and 29. We're going to have a brief word of prayer. We'll give a little background, and then we'll get right into our lesson text. Eternal God, our Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. Lord, we thank you for blessing us in so many seen and unseen ways, always for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. Lord, we pray that you'd give us a clear understanding of your word, Lord, how we are no longer under the law, Lord, but we have been saved by your grace, a grace that was given by promise first to Abraham, and then all those who have believed in you, Lord, through Jesus Christ. We thank you for what he did on the cross for us. We thank you that we have access to you through him, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that we would do all that you would have us to do in this freedom that you've given us through grace, Lord, to your praise and glory. As we understand this lesson, Lord, we pray that you would increase our faith. And as you increase our faith, we pray that you would increase our obedience to your word and will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the way of a little background on our lesson, um, Paul is writing to uh, the church at Galatia, the Christians at Galatia. Galatia was uh, located in what is now modern day Turkey, and it was uh, founded by Paul. It's not clear whether it was during his first or second missionary um, journey. Uh, however, um, he, he is clearly the founder of the church, which was primarily Gentile. Uh, it was primarily a Gentile church. And as we um, 
get into our lesson, we will, and actually if you've read chapters 1 and 2, then you know that that church was being influenced by uh, a group called the Judaizers. Judaizers were uh, Jews that uh, were requiring of any new believer strict adherence to the Mosaic Law, including circumcision for male, in addition to acceptance of Christ by faith. Uh, you can't have one without the other. You can't require uh, uh, strict adherence to the law, uh, ostensibly for the purposes of salvation, of being saved, and acceptance of Christ by faith for salvation. So uh, Paul is trying to set the record straight. Galatians are being uh, led to believe that they must keep the law uh, as well as uh, have faith in Jesus Christ. And obviously that's, that's, that, that must have confused them. So Paul, this, most of this epistle is uh, focused on that. He's also making uh, clear what the purpose of the law uh, was as intended by God. Uh, and he's making it clear that uh, there's no conflict or contradiction between the law and the grace or promise uh, that uh, God uh, gave first to Abraham and then to all who would believe uh, 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 after him. Uh, he's explaining how Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Uh, the law served its purpose. And we'll get more into that and, and actually uh, allowing us to uh, come to know the holiness of God and his righteous standard also provides, uh, as we will discuss here in a minute, uh, for the way that God would have us to live and govern ourselves. Now, it is perhaps one of the oldest, if not the oldest epistle of Paul, uh, and it was... Uh, written shortly after uh, the council that was held in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. So around 48, 49 AD is believed when this, uh, when this was written shortly after 49 AD. So we're going to jump right into our lesson. Uh, we're going to read the first passage uh, under the division heading to guard us for God. It's Galatians chapter 3 verses 18 to 21. And I'm going to read from the uh, King James Version. I might uh, have occasion to read from the NIV as well for greater clarity, but uh, let's try reading from the King James Version. For if the inheritance of the law, I'm sorry, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise but God gave it to Abraham by promise wherefore then serveth the law or for what reason does the law serve it was added because of transgressions to the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator now a mediator is not a mediator of one but God is one. Verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So let's back up to verse 18. 18a reads, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. Now, um, when you see uh, a four in a verse or a verse beginning with a four, uh, we need to go back and understand what the four is there for. So we're going to back up a little bit and see what the four is in reference to. So we're going to back up to verse 16 of chapter 3, and it reads, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. 
and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say that the law which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant or promise that was confirmed before by God in Christ that it should make the promise of no effect. So the law came later, 430 years later, after God gave his promise to Abraham, beginning in uh, Genesis chapter 12. Uh, and so that's our frame of reference. So eight, verse 18 then begins with, For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham. The inheritance, the inheritance uh, that God promised Abraham, he was going to multiply his seed, he was going to give them this promised land. Ultimately, through uh, his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, and that has happened. All the nations of the earth have been blessed by the seed, that is Christ, with eternal life if they believe in what Christ did on the cross. And, and what that partial verse is saying is, if the inheritance, if what has been promised uh, is only, uh, only going to be gained by you keeping the law, it is not a promise. And this word promise really derives from um, a gift of grace or charis. We'll say a little bit more about that perhaps in a minute. We go on to part uh, B, and it says... Let me let me hold on just a second. Let me back up a little bit. And I, I really wish I had time to go to all the, uh, the the references, the scripture references that I have. But when you have time, please take a look at Romans chapter four, verses thirteen to sixteen. Uh, verse thirteen begins: For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And 14 goes on. Um, so read through um, through 16, if you will. 14 goes on. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Um, wish we had more time. I'm going to be giving other scripture references. Please do read them for greater understanding of our, our text today. So part B of 18 says, but God gave it to Abraham by promise, which means it was a free gift of grace or charis. It was given, uh, there was no obligation for Abraham to do anything. Uh, if you're um, a student of the Bible, you know that God gave unconditional promises such as to Abraham and his seed and to David. He also gave conditional promises uh, through Moses. Uh, the children of Israel staying in the land and being blessed in the land was conditioned on them keeping the law and being faithful to God and not uh, worshiping and serving idols. Verse 19a reads, Wherefore then serveth the law? And I know that's an archaic term, wherefore, so the NIV says, why then was the law given at all? And, well, that is uh, one of many uh, rhetorical questions that Paul answers. Obviously, he knows the answer, and uh, he is going to clarify that here shortly for uh, his readers. So he asked a rhetorical question, you know, um, that the, if the law doesn't have anything to do with your salvation, what purpose does it serve? 19b says, it was added because of transgressions to the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That's the KJV version. The NIV reads, it was added because of transgressions until the seed whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. Now, it was added because of our uh, lawlessness, okay, or the fact that we violated the boundaries set by God. 
uh, we see Romans 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 23. Uh, it was added to reveal the nature and extent of human uh, transgressions, or if you will, violations of the boundaries set by God. Uh, in other words, it was added to show us our sin. Uh, uh, it, it was added to show us God's right, uh, righteous standard and our sin in comparison to those righteous standards. Now we're going to say more about that as we go through. Uh, the third part of that uh, verse says, and it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. Now, that might be a bit confusing. Confusing. Some commentators say, well, there was a mediator between Moses and God uh, when God gave the law to Moses. But we know, we, we know that the, the Bible teaches that angels were involved in giving the law. We can see, uh, let's take a look at Acts chapter 7, verse 53, Hebrews 2, uh, verse 2. But... Uh, we don't really get a good explanation as to precisely what role they played, but we simply know that angels had some part in mediating the law and, and being a go-between, if you will, between God and Moses as he dispensed the law. Verse 20 reads, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Now, as you know, a mediator is one, is a go-between, if you will, uh, between two parties. And we know that for believers, Christ Jesus is our mediator between God and humans, between God and us. We can see that in many places, uh, 1 Timothy 2 and 5 and elsewhere. And... Uh, you know, the law differentiated between Jews and Gentiles. When we get further into the lesson, we're going to see how uh, in God, in Christ, there is one people. Okay, and there's no distinction. The middle wall of partition has been torn down. See that in Ephesians. But um, it says God is, is one and his people through faith in Christ or one. Romans three twenty nine to 30. And we're going to, when we get down to verse 28, we'll say more about that. Verse 21a, uh, <clears throat> again, Paul asks a rhetorical question. Is the law then against the promise promises of God? God forbid. That's a favorite term of Paul's, or perish the thought. So, so now Paul is not in their presence. He's writing them. So he's anticipating the questions that they might have when they read this epistle. And he's offering some rebuttal to the questions that they might have. Part B reads, For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law or the righteous standard or justification before God would have been given by the keeping of the law if salvation could be gained or that righteousness could be gained by keeping of the law. Now let's understand um, the purpose of the law was to show us our need of this righteous standard, how far from the righteous standard we were. I often give a, <clears throat> uh, an example of uh, somebody that's been working perhaps in the yard uh, as I'll be doing in a little bit today, uh, and getting mud, uh, perhaps on their face. Uh, and then uh, when they look in the mirror, uh, they see this mud. Uh, they see sweat and mud and on their face. Uh, well, the law is like a mirror that shows you your sin, that shows you your transgressions, your righteousness in comparison to the righteous standards of God. But it cannot wash that mud and sweat off your face. Uh, you need a cleansing agent and a, a cloth or what have you to get that off your face. And that is the salvation that is by promise or by grace that is given. Uh, so the law has a purpose in letting you know your state, your state, your sinful state, your filthy state and your need 
of righteousness, your need to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, that righteousness that is a foreign righteousness that is imputed to us or credited to our account, and that righteousness by which we have a standing before God and we have a relationship with God. So we're going to try to pick up the pace a little bit here. We're going to move into our second division, which is entitled To Guide Us to God, uh, Galatians 3, 22 to 25. And again, from the NIV, I'm sorry, from the KJV. Well, let's, let's read this from the NIV so we don't go back and forth. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law locked up under faith that was to come uh, would be revealed locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed verse 24 so the law was our guardian king james says our schoolmaster or tutor until christ came that we might be justified by faith now that this faith has come we are no longer under a guardian so let's back up to verse 22 again and it reads uh, but scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe now <clears throat> we know that um, uh, the law determined or concluded that both Jew and Gentiles were under sin. Look at Romans 3 and verse 9. And all people were guilty. Romans 3, 10 to 18. And Paul uh, uh, declared that all were guilty under the law. And as I mentioned, all had the dirty faces that need to be washed. Uh, all are unfit to receive life on the basis of the law or eternal life or justification before God or a right standard standing rather before God we need to understand that God's plan never depended on the law to save us God's plan from the beginning was that Jesus would bear our sins on the cross and would impute his righteousness uh, to us again credited to our accounts that we might be given a righteous standard before God or justified before God by his righteousness and have a relationship with God through him and eternal life now again we're going to go on um, later and talk more about it but this promise was extended to all not just the Jews uh, all who believe we know John 3 16 says uh, that whosoever whoever believes uh, in uh, in Christ uh, the uh, the only begotten son uh, would be saved verse 23 before the coming of this faith we were held in custody under the law locked up until the faith was to come, that was to come would be revealed one of the commentators, uh, the Faith Pathway commentator says, the law shows us God's heart and protects us by, number one, showing us the best way to live. Number two, showing what behaviors should be approved and disapproved. And number three, providing a foundation for civil law. And we know that um, most of the Western world uh, derived its standards for laws, civil laws, from the Bible, uh, particularly the Old Testament. Uh, and uh, that we know that those laws are beginning to erode now and beginning to be uh, nullified, but uh, that had been the standard for, for generations, for, for centuries. Now, uh, verse 23 reads, I'm sorry, I just read 23, 24. Uh, so the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. And I learned something 
uh, just a little nuance here uh, uh, concerning this verse. Uh, I had uh, read the King James Version, which refers to uh, a schoolmaster uh, to bring us unto Christ, and, and that's also translated tutor in other versions. Uh, and you can understand a young person uh, who is an heir of, uh, let's say, a great household, uh, but he's a child and he's immature, uh, being uh, set under a tutor. A tutor might have all, uh, might have been a slave or another servant, uh, older and wiser, and that tutor was to govern this young person until that person matured, and was mature enough to inherit what was rightfully his to inherit. That is the promise. Okay. Now, um, however, the uh, Faith Pathway commentator said this word translated guardian is one that leads one to the master the master teachers uh, and that's just a little slight nuance there uh, he says once the person the immature person is led to the master or master teacher there's no longer a need for the guardian to lead that person to the master so I think either way uh, we can understand this guardian, this tutor, this schoolmaster as one who governs, who one who guides, one who controls uh, the person until the time set of the father for the heir to receive the inheritance. In this case, it is the promise of salvation through faith. Verse 25 reads, Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Again, if this guardian is one that leads a person to the schoolmaster, or the master rather, the master teacher, then there's no longer a need. Even if this is one that, again, governs or controls the child until he reaches an age of maturity where he is capable of receiving the full inheritance, uh, he is, uh, uh, the same meaning I think uh, applies. So let's move into our last division, which is entitled, To Give All to God. To Give All to God. It's taken from Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. And it reads again from the NIV. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, all of you rather, who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile neither slave nor free nor there nor is there male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus verse 29 if you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise so backing up to verse 26 it says so and that is referring to uh, everything that's been said so far in this passage okay if this is so in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith the law has not saved you your faith in Christ has saved you so we're children of God by faith in what Christ did on the cross and what does that really mean we <sighs> Our faith is based on, uh, actually is uh, uh, the belief, firm, st steadfast belief that Christ is who he said he was and that was God, the second person of the Trinity, and that he accomplished what he said he accomplished. He bore our sins on the cross, he rose from the dead and he is now a mediator between God and man. His righteousness was imputed, again, I keep using that word, it's an accounting term, transferred to our account, and we are clothed, as we will see, uh, clothed in a figurative sense in his righteousness. Our filthy rags have been exchanged for a brilliant righteous robe, representing, again, the righteousness of Christ. Verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So uh, 
Paul reminded uh, the, the readers that, uh, that they had been baptized into Christ. We have entered into Christ. And, and he stresses the importance of baptism for believers. Baptism unites the believer with the death of Christ and the glory of his resurrection. See Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 7. Uh, and um, we can also see that uh, this, well, some of us may, may realize that this baptism is an outward uh, confession, profession of what has already been done inwardly. There's no salvation in the baptism in and of itself, but it is the tokens such as the, the circumcision was for the Jews and throughout the Old Testament uh, that we are uh, we are his people we are God's people uh, and we are um, identified with Christ through this baptism it is again uh, not a means of salvation in of itself but it evidences what has already been done by the Holy Spirit and then finally we're going to look at um, well much more could be said about uh, 27 before we get to our next verse when we talk about being clothed in Christ one of the commentators says to put on Christ implied putting to death the sinful nature and being renewed with a new nature transformed by Christ you see that in Romans 13 13 to 14 and Colossians 3 5 to 14 the prophet Isaiah rejoiced when God clothed me with a garment of salvation, that's Isaiah 61:10. So, it is uh, it is really transformative. We are not simply going through a ritual uh, and assuming ourselves to be uh, 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 righteous, uh, but we are uh, actually uh, given a new life. We are new creatures in Christ, and we are uh, we die to sin, and that is represented by our submersion in the water and we're raised to newness of life in Christ we're raised to live for Christ so we are not only symbolically clothed in his righteousness but we are to live the righteous life empowered by the Holy Spirit that God desires us to live from the point of salvation now then we move into verse 28 which reads therefore I'm sorry <clears throat> there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. We could say a whole lot about this verse, but we're not going to spend as much time as uh, we might. But let me say this, uh, it is very important that we understand that there's no schism, no division in the body of Christ. Many today are trying to create divisions and distinctions that God does not make. He makes it clear here and elsewhere that we are one in Christ. The, the law, as we said earlier, makes quite a distinction between Jew and Gentile. Uh, and, and obviously there were cultural, tremendous cultural differences between bond and free or uh, slaves and free people and male and female uh, that, uh, of course, Paul recognized. But in Christ, there's no difference. There's no black lives matter with Christ. All lives matter. And all who come to faith in Jesus Christ are, uh, are his, uh, his children, are the children of God. And they have a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to be clear about that because uh, I think some uh, uh, blacks in particular, and I'm sure whites as well, think that uh, there's a black church and there's a white church and we need to make these distinctions, have these distinctions uh, and make sure that, and, and, they're, and they're concerned about obviously their sin, there's going to be prejudice, there's going to be uh, all kinds of uh, 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 disparities uh, because of sin in the world. But in Christ, in the church, there should not be. I mean, the world is, is a sin sick and dying world and we know that we are not to bring the world and its values and what it esteems and what it uh, 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 what it what it what it teaches as a culture into the church. 
much more could be said about that. But uh, I just want us to know that uh, there's neither black or white, red, green, black, or yellow. Uh, there's neither Jew or Gentile, bond or free, uh, male or female in Christ. We're all one in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can read more about what uh, Christ has done uh, in breaking down uh, the middle wall, the partition between uh, Jews and Gentiles in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and 18. Well, that middle wall of partition, uh, that enmity between uh, those two groups uh, uh, can be, it, it, it's uh, similar to what we see between blacks and whites and between other uh, ethnic ethnicities now. And that wall, those walls have been broken down through Christ and we are all one in Christ. And finally, uh, we're going to move into verse 29, which reads, If you belong to Christ, then ye are, you rather are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, from the uh, Faith Pathway um, commentator, um, the... Uh, the commentator says you believe themselves to be exclusively Abraham's seed. We see that in Matthew 3 and 9, John 8 and 39. Uh, Paul teaches with authority that by faith every believer is adopted or grafted into the family of Abraham by Christ Jesus according to the promise of God. And he says the promise, this promise comes from God for all the nations of the earth. It came without the conditions of circumcision or adherence to the law, both of which did not exist at the time uh, God gave the promise. That's the promise to Abraham, in Genesis, beginning in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And all, his all he requires is faith. This is from beginning from the beginning, God wanted all humanity to trust him, walking by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 and Romans 1, 17. So if we are heirs, according to the promise, it means we have full access to the promise of God's blessings. Uh, and his spirit would be present in the lives of believers. And we, we could say much more about this. As you can look at uh, 2 Corinthians 1, uh, verses 20 to 22. Uh, God called uh, Abraham out of, uh, we know, the land of Ur, uh, one man, uh, and made himself known to him and gave him great promises, uh, the fulfillment of which would be based on his faith and the faith of his descendants only. It was unconditional. All Abraham had to do was to believe God's promise. And that's all any of us who would likewise have believed God's promise of, his, of salvation, of justification, that is being given a right standing before God, of his promise to sanctify us. And that is to... Uh, empower us in our Christian walk uh, and to enable us to shape us to mold us more and more into the image of Christ as we mature in him and then of course uh, deliverance from this sin sick and dying world to be in his presence throughout eternity so God has given us great promises uh, and we are uh, al aligned if you will with Abraham and a part of his faith family we certainly are not uh, part of his family uh, physically any more than we are of any humankind however we are descendants uh, of him by faith as we imitate the same faith that that God uh, uh, matured if you will in Abraham when he uh, offered his own was about to offer his own son Isaac uh, uh, and realizing that God would raise him from the dead because of his promise that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So we hope that we've learned uh, a little more about this passage than perhaps we did. 
Uh, let's understand that the law had a purpose. Uh, laws today have a purpose, of course, to they're, they're mostly for the ungodly, but they are to conform us to uh, right standards, right living, uh, the basis for our civil law to the extent they still are, but they have nothing to do with our salvation. They are just to show us where we're in error, when we're in error, but our salvation is by faith and faith alone. So we pray that God will bless you until such time as we, we meet again.